welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. More than 178,000 different types of arms and ammunition were declared missing from the Nigerian Police Armory in 2019 without a trace. That is according to the Federation's annual report on non compliance, internal control weaknesses issues in ministries, departments, and agencies of the Federal Government of Nigeria for the year ended December 31st, 2019. The report states on page 383 to 391 that the whereabouts of the ammunition are not known. The new report states that 178,459 different types of arms and ammunition got missing from the police armory in 2019. The Auditor General of the Federation's annual report on non-compliance and internal control weaknesses in ministries, departments and agencies of the federal government shows that 88,078 AK-47 rifles, 3,907 assorted rifles and pistols from different formations nationwide could not be accounted for as of January 2020. The report, which was submitted to the National Assembly, states that the action contravenes paragraph 2603 of the financial regulations, which stipulates that in the event of any loss of stores, the officer in charge of the store in which the loss occurs shall report immediately to the head of department or unit but not later than three days by the fastest means possible if the loss occurs away from the headquarters. The report was generated from the review of three sources, the Arms Movement Register, Monthly Returns of Arms and Ammunition, and Ammunition Register, all at the Armory section of the Nigerian Police. While the report captures the situation in 2019, the Nigeria Police reported several raids of their Armory in 2020 during the aftermath of the NSAS riots. Also in 2021, several attacks on police installations, especially in the southeast, were attributed to the activities of the proscribed indigenous people of Biafra, IPOP. In December 2021, the police said it recovered a total of 1,887 sophisticated firearms in several raids across the country. While the police headquarters is yet to formally respond to this new report, Nigerians and security analysts are calling for a detailed audit to know the current situation of the Nigeria Police Armory. Ferdinand Duroha, Arise News. Our guests this morning are Dr. Kabir Adamu, a security risk management expert, and Ezenwa Nwago, Chairman Partners for Electoral Reform and Convener Say No Campaign Nigeria. They will be discussing this issue and allied matters. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. On a good note for you guys. Good morning. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think the issue here for me uh, is that one, I think we should commend uh, an agency of government that has drawn attention to the fact that uh, this huge number uh, of arms and ammunition uh, is missing, uh, but then is very worrisome. Uh, and it doesn't seem to be the first time uh, that this will happen. H how worried do you think we should be? And how do you think that government should... Uh, begin to tackle this sort of menace, uh, even though the police uh, is yet to formally respond uh, to this uh, audit query. Um, me? Dr. Adamo, you can, you can go first, if that's fine. Can you hear All right. us? All right. Please go ahead. Yes, I, I can. Okay. So first off, um, it's, it's an audit report. Yes. An audit report means the would have sat down with the police over time and would have looked at um, the documents as well as uh, compliance um, regulations. Uh, so as an example, um, three major documents were mentioned in the, in the audit report. The, um, the armament um, movement now, uh, as well as the monthly um, armament report. Now, it is expectedly, these are documents that are within the custody of the armory or the armament unit within the. What the report meant, there were clients to established regulations for um, the operations of, of that particular unit. Uh, we can go through the report, a couple of things were mentioned. So, uh, weapons that were lost or weapons that were stolen. Um, what 
For instance, that if a, a, a police operative is issued a weapon, a service issued weapon, and then he goes out on an operation and he was attacked by a terrorist or whatever, and that weapon was lost, quote and unquote, there was no evidence within the armament unit to document that, that, that loss. Um, now, what it means also is that any, quote and unquote, corrupt police official could uh, fall co- under the cover of that and say if points and his weapon is, is, is lost because it, it, it's not documented, it's not reported. So that's, I think, the crux of the matter, the lack of compliance to lay down regulations. The second element that I would like to highlight is the period report. Even though um, it wasn't ex- explicitly clear in the report what period, but at the section of the report, we were told documentation um, looked at was from the year 2000 up to 2019, so a period of about 19 years. And so I think we can well reasonably conclude that this alleged 78,000 weapons is for that period of about 19 years. The third element is the relation, the correlation between these weapons that have disappeared and the current security challenges we have in the country. There is enough evidence to indicate that um, some of these weapons, well, of the various threat actors that we have in the country, terrorists, um, criminals, um, ethnic militias, n- name them. Uh, perhaps in the course of the conversation, we can, I, I, I run a consultancy and we did uh, do a research, a survey into this particular issue and were able to establish uh, beyond um, reasonable doubt that there is a positive correlation between uh, the disappearance of weapons within the armory of our security agencies and the current security challenges we have in the country. All right. Of course, we, we want to commend, as Steve rightfully mentioned, the fact that this was brought to light. But we also have to take um, cognizance of the fact that it took this long for us to find out about it, um, which, of course, um, you know, points to loopholes in the system, as have just been mentioned. Let's talk about this issue of the documentation. What does it take for us to have the right um, documentation process, however sophisticated or unsophisticated it is, so that we do not have these kinds of issues? What does it actually take? Is it cost? Is it uh, having the right training for that? Why do we not have this kind of documentation to be able to account for a situation like this? Or as in one while ago, please. Well, thank you. Thank you, Abhi. Uh, there's, there's a difference between um, ignorance and mischief. And what, what has continued to happen for me is not a case of not knowing what to do. Uh, we have had a police institution that has carried a baggage of um, reputational challenge over a period of time. And uh, the report is talking about 19 years. But if you remember, the the Anini and the um, uh, Lawrence Anini Monday or Sumbo uh, situation was clear uh, to the extent that criminals openly were telling the country that they got the arms with which they were operating from a certain police officer. So we already have some historical antecedent to hold on to in, in terms of understanding that when people don't document, um, it means that they have been left with a situation in which uh, they can decide to document or not document. And once uh, discretion is at play, then corruption is very close. So the, the police institution is, in a way, responsible because there are no sanctions. The, 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 no sanctions for misbehavior, no sanctions for you know, dereliction of duty. Um, so what we have had is that we have had plenty cover-ups over a period of time. And the audit report clearly now has brought the... Well, still with you, Mr. Nwagu. Please carry on. Okay. So um, the, the, we, we've had situations in which... These reports have come. There have been plenty of reports around uh, the, the policing service that we have gotten in our country. 
uh, at the end of the day, you shift from one point to the other without necessarily shifting in terms of how to organize and ensure that uh, the processes are, you know, and the laws, regulations that guide policing and, and sanctions are followed through. So that, that's what we face. Um, so the audit report uh, is important because it now becomes an advocacy tool for people who are enthusiastic about having a police service that, that, that is accountable to the people, that is responsible and, and, and orderly. That's, that's what that report will be. And, and I think it's our responsibility as civil society and the media to take on that report and put it constantly in the front border so that it can be actioned. Beyond that, it will go into the, um, into the records that, yes, there was this audit in 2021, and this is what he said. But if you now follow through to track what has been actioned in, in those reports, you are, not, you are not going to get anything. So for me, it's that the whole reform process for the police taking it away from the colonial complexioning that we have known the police to have come from to a modern police is the, is the challenge that we have. We have not been able to do that. We have had a police that has been running for the interest of, of, of those who put them there and not the interest of the people for who they are supposed to render services to. All right, Mr. Izenwa uh, and Dr. Adamu, uh, please uh, do stay with us. We will go on a quick short break now, and when we return, we'll continue with the conversation uh, on all the missing arms and ammunition. Do stay with us. You're welcome back to the Morning Show on Arise News, and we're still on uh, with uh, Mr. Izenwa Nwagu and uh, Dr. Kabir Adamu uh, speaking about the uh, missing, the report about the missing arms and ammunition uh, in the country, 19-year uh, report uh, culminating in 2019. Uh, Mr. Nwagu, uh, I'd like to still stay with you uh, quickly before we go to Dr. Uh, Adamo. And you made very good points uh, about the you know, correlation between uh, what we are witnessing now and the fact that the necessary reforms um, in the police uh, have not taken place. How do you think that we should begin to retrace our steps, uh, addressing the points raised uh, in this audit, audit report, and then making the case for the general reforms in the police? Uh, in the news report that we read, yes, the NSAS thing came in, but that was in 2020, uh, before this uh, report, uh, the period that this report covered. But we know, of course, that uh, IPOP, um, if, if, if we are to go by, the, by what we have in the report, um, a lot of attacks happen on police formations. NSAS too, even in, even in 2020, when that happened, um, uh, many uh, police stations were attacked, many arms and ammunition were stolen. So it, it goes beyond the question of documentation. It also is it's also about the fact that we do not have a police force of our dreams. How do we now proceed in terms of reforms one and in addressing in specific terms the issues that this audit report uh, has raised. Well, you had, um, Steve, you're dealing with a long-term, uh, long-term and then immediate, uh, yes, things that, that can be done. In the, in the immediate, uh, addressing the issues that the audit report has raised is to um, create stronger institutional framework within the police service system. Uh, that helps to track, follow, and then sanction if there are uh, breaches of any kind. Um, th that, that will be important. And that takes, first and foremost, determination of the police leadership. Uh, uh, because what, what, what is, is some of what happens is a collaborative network of criminal activity within that system. It, it's, it's not just an individual. Somebody protects the one who has carried out the act and profits from, from that. And this is what we know over a period of time that we paper over. So the, the, it, it's first and foremost, you need to have a leadership that is, that is patriotic, that is really interested in driving change within the police. Every time you appoint an IG, they come with some kind of point agenda. And then you, when, you, when you leave the, the headquarters and drive a little out of out of that place, and then you meet a policeman on the way, he tells you that those guys are just ranting, that they don't, they, that it has, it's, it's not percolating. 
Uh, they, so it, it, you need to have a leadership that is strong, that is interested in internal reforms, and, and that will drive that reform uh, and ensure that, first and foremost, internally, there is, there is that, um, that respect for, in, for, for order. If you, if you go to a police station and see a sergeant or an inspector talking to a corporal, sometimes you really wonder whether there is discipline, what, whether that discipline is still, is still there. It, it's just less for race and, and anyhow things, because the, 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 the hada is eating what the cow eats, and so the, the, the cow has no reason to respect the hada. So that, for me, is, is first and foremost important that we deal with that, that the leadership itself. And then when that leadership is not responding, the, the hiring authority must be able to wield the big stick. So it is a whole web of collaboration that has put us where we are. Uh, the, police, the police council that is headed by the president and peopled by all, they need to also act up and, and ensure that that discipline, that internal discipline within the institution is, is, uh, is, is maintained. That, that is in the immediate. That's one way to be able to uh, uh, you know, deal with the, the, the report. But for the broader issue of the reforms that we, that we seek in the, in, in the police service delivery um, effort, what, are, what has always happened is that the, the police has always been controlled by the dominant interests within the places that they are serving. Sometimes it may not even be governmental. Sometimes it's individual. Sometimes it will be corporate institutions. I often say that when people donate vehicles to the police and then there is an infraction between a citizen and that institution that donated those vehicles to the police, how does the police respond? Using the vehicle that was donated to them to go and arrest those who, who have... So you have a whole lot of issues. So transitioning from a police that serves the interest of the powerful, the strong, and, and oppresses the weak is what we're going to deal with. And that was what the colonial masters were doing. The colonial masters used the police service to further their own interests. Those who took over from them continue to behave in that colonial manner. So you need to first ideologically you know, you know, perform a surgery within that institution to raise a new ideology. I think it was the state of Georgia that shut down the police for up two years or, or thereabout and brought new people, new, new messaging, new ideology that can drive the kind of change that we have. Otherwise, the person, when you have people in police colleges jumping the fence to go and mount illegal roadblock, when they, when they graduate from that police college, what are they going to be doing? So... We, we already have a terrible, terrible, scandalous system that needs real, real work to be able to reform the police in the sense in which we are looking at it. But in the immediate, we can begin to restructure internal systems that will help to close up some of the gaps that we have seen. But for a broader reform, not answers, not even one protest or two can deal with the rot and, and, and decay that you have in that system. All right, Dr. Kabir Adamu. So, of course, uh, over 178,000 firearms and ammunition missing from the police armory. One would say that this is not just laughable, it's, it's also quite reprehensible for a country that is in the wake of insecurity and banditry at this moment. This is not um, a joke. What do we know about accountability in this particular situation? And, of course, prospects for recovering these arms. Or are we just shooting darts in the dark? Um, so that is uh, another uh, gray area, accountability. And in fact, left to me, that should be the priority here. Let's remember that this audit report was submitted to the National Assembly. So um, just like um, Evie mentioned, we're hoping that when the National Assembly resumes, the relevant committee uh, to whom these reports were submitted would pick it up and start looking at the issue. We're talking of um, successive um, inspectors general of police over a period of 19 years, and none of them could, you know, come to a conclusion on this issue and stop it, its occurrence. We're talking of several um, DIGs probably who headed this armament unit. 
Now, when we speak of accountability, it means individuals should be identified who, uh, quote unquote, dropped the ball and allowed this impunity to have continued up to this point. And then we're talking of um, an investigation that would, uh, that would show clearly uh, their rule um, and how their inability to perform their duties led to uh, this situation where we are. We're also talking of the various personnel who were affected. There are forms um, as identified in that report that should have been filled and submitted. Those forms were never submitted. So from the personnel in the field who was affected to the person in the office who should have followed up to ensure those forms were submitted, um, to the person in charge of that department who should have, um, over a period, um, ensured that where there were infractions, those infractions were corrected, to the internal audit system within the police that um, ultimately should have done an internal audit, identified these loopholes and corrected them, to the inspector general of police at that particular period, over, of course, like we said, 19 years, so successful since the inspector general of police uh, should have Take, done the right thing, which is to ensure that these things do not continue. Now, in terms of accountability, all of these persons that I've mentioned, unfortunately, had a role to play. Uh, and definitely, if the um, parliament does its work, those individuals should be identified. Some of them are still alive. Some of them are still within service. And one way or the other should be held accountable. Um, that's what we're hoping going forward. It's a responsibility for every Nigerian that I'm hoping the media and civil society organizations will take up um, where, where we are because of these types of infractions. Just like Izzy mentioned, there have been several instances where uh, it's been proven beyond really reasonable doubt that um, security officials, including the police, one way or the other contributed to the current um, insecurity challenge that we have in the country. There is um, this individual named Ali Para. He's very famous in the North. Uh, he's been engaged by the police itself several times to investigate uh, you know, criminal um, offenses. And not once, not twice, severally, uh, he has shown where service issued weapons um, were used in the, the, uh, the, the acts that he was investigating. Um, so frankly, it's, it's, it's not in, in doubt within several spaces that the, 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 the issues identified in this report are issues that were known to the police, but unfortunately they never took action. So yes, accountability is important and that responsibility should start with the work of the parliament. But I also think the, the current inspector general of police who superintends over uh, the police has a responsibility to take up that report and, and look critically at, at who, in terms of what individuals um, played a, a role in that regard. Then I, the Minister of Police Affairs, too, who has some administrative responsibility over the police, should also look at that. To an extent, the Police Service Commission should also have um, some element of responsibility in this regard. So there are various areas of responsibility and accountability that, going forward, um, should uh, take up responsibility for the issues All being, right, um, highlighted. Right. But, but very briefly, please, do, uh, is there any hope of actually recovering these firearms and ammunition? Um, yes, uh, there is hope, but it's a very long group that um, worries me. So as you're probably aware, the president has appointed um, someone to head uh, a, a, a unit within the Office of the National Security Advisor for the mopping up of small arms and light weapons. He has also submitted a bill to the parliament for the creation of a commission on small arms and light weapons. And the parliament itself has also begun um, the discussion on uh, its own bill. So we're hoping that in the next few months, there will be a harmonization of both the presidential and then the parliament um, bill on, on that. So that at the end of the day, we, we can have a commission on the mopping up on small arms and light weapons. And that, that commission will look at areas like the, this particular area that we're discussing. So there is hope, but it's a very long group because this issue has been in the front burner. As far back as 14 years ago, the ECOWAS um, recommended all its member states to have that commission. Nigeria, I think, is the only ECOWAS member state that still does not have that commission. Okay, uh, Mr. Izenwa, maybe this, of course, this will be the last question given the time, short time that we have. Uh, this is not peculiar to Nigeria. It's all over Africa. As a matter of fact, the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, 
you know, released a, a major report detailing how this is, you know, an African problem. In South Africa, in Ju between July and September this year, uh, last year, and more than a million bullets and ammunition were stolen. How do you think that regional uh, authorities, ECOWAS, EU, can begin to come together and nip this kind of a thing in the board? Yes, they go missing. Yes, they are stolen. But then it looks like they are being recycled all over the continent. How can regional governments and institutions come in to stem this? Well, when, when a problem is, when you identify a problem as regional, one of the ways to deal with it is to have a domestic, first have a, your own domestic response to that challenge. So when your own domestic response to that challenge is weak, uh, the regional thing will be, will be on the air. So first and foremost, what are we doing to deal with the challenge that we face? What are the institutions that has to respond to those, those challenges? Uh, Kabir was talking about the National Assembly, the relevant committees. And, and you, you know, you, 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 sometimes what worries me is that you need to also have a patriotic National Assembly, a National Assembly that is not collaborating and relating with the institutions that they are supposed to oversight in a way that is compromising. And once that happens, you are not going to have the necessary check that you require. So I, I'm more interested in what the, the domestic response is. Mm. The, the regional is not, the regional is like, a, is like a goat that is owned by the community. Sometimes it, it dies of starvation. If, if there is somebody who is responsible for feeding that goat, the goat will, the goat will be alive. Everybody thinks somebody is doing something, but nobody is doing anything. So let's deal with our domestic response capabilities and then oil them in a way that they can become effective and deal with the challenge that we face. If we secure our own environment, other people secure their own environment, then the regional is safe. All right, we want to thank you, Mr. Ezen Wagu and Dr. Kabi Adimu for engaging with us on this topic today. Uh, thank you so much for your time.